So in this video, we're going to be talking about hypothyroidism. I'm going to be going over the symptoms as well as the testing and the diagnostics and the various hormones involved, but most importantly, what you can do about it right now to get relief. So just in a nutshell, hypothyroidism is a condition in which the thyroid gland doesn't work as well as it should. Now, the thyroid is this uh, butterfly-shaped gland that is located just in front of the windpipe and just beneath the Adam's apple. And this is responsible for regulating your metabolism. So when it's not functioning as well, it slows down your metabolism, which can result in a, um, a wide range of symptoms. So let's get started. Let's start talking about that. What are the symptoms? Uh, what, is the, uh, what are the diagnostics and what can be done about it? Some of the symptoms could be tiredness, weight gain. I put an asterisk next to this because this is sometimes a very defining factor. Uh, in this condition, when the thyroid gland, when the metabolism becomes really low, really weakened, uh, a person tends to gain weight. And even if they go on a diet, even if they try to starve themselves, they have a real hard time losing that weight. In fact, uh, hypothyroidism is one of the causes of unexplained weight gain or difficulty with losing weight. So it's always important that if you have a weight problem, make sure you get your thyroid checked, uh, among other, other things. Uh, next is sensitivity to cold, very common in hypothyroidism as well. Constipation and other issues uh, with the digestive system, as well as a really, really low appetite in some cases. Um, and uh, it, it may also take, I've noticed, and in some people, it takes a long time for them to digest their meals as well. Uh, slow movements, their body overall, they, they react really slowly as well. People with, the, with this issue tend to have very slow reactions. Uh, muscle aches, as well as cramping. Uh, weakness overall can be a symptom as well. Uh, difficulty thinking, slowness in thinking, difficulty in, with recollection and other aspects of one's cognitive function. Uh, I put constipation again, please ignore that. Uh, and hair loss. Hair loss is another big one. Now, you won't necessarily experience all of these symptoms. You may not even experience some of these symptoms. You may only get one or two if you're lucky. If you really got dealt a bad hand, you may get a lot of them. Uh, but keep in mind that there are solutions. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Uh, so how is a diagnosis typically made? Well, basically, when you go to see a physician and you present with any of these symptoms or anything that may suggest an issue with the thyroid, they will test for certain things. Now, most the most common test is uh, the TSH test. That stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, the problem is that some people, some of these physicians only test that, which is not the way thyroid testing is supposed to be done. There's way more to it. Now, basically, TSH is secreted by the pituitary gland, which is located uh, in the brain, around the midbrain, in the midbrain, sorry. And... Uh, it releases this hormone called TSH, which is supposed to stimulate the thyroid gland to start producing thyroid hormones. However, please forgive my awful arrow. When uh, this doesn't happen, the pituitary gland starts to push out more TSH. So you'll notice that in these people, the TSH levels tend to be elevated. Now, uh, that is not the end of it. That is not how a diagnosis uh, should be um, that's not, that's not the, the end all of the diagnosis. There's more to it because you also have to check the T4 levels, T3 levels, and the reverse T3 levels. Now, what are these? T4 is basically the thyroid hormone that has to be secreted by the thyroid gland itself. Uh, and that is actually an inactive form of the hormone. T4 stands for thyroxine. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's 98% inactive. It has to become activated and converted into T3, which is known as triiodothyronine. And uh, at the same time, there's another form of T3 called reverse T3. So these all have to be tested. Why do they have to be tested? Well, if you find that the T4 is high and the T3 is low, that means the conversion is not taking place. If you find that the reverse T3 is high and the T3 is low, uh, that means that your body is gonna, you're going to have the same symptoms of hypothyroidism because T3, reverse T3, is inactive, but it binds to the same receptors as T3. Uh, so what can happen is those symptoms can also mimic hypothyroidism. And re typically, reverse T3 has a function in the body, and that is believed to be a buffering agent for T3 to prevent your body to go 
from going into a state known as thyrotoxicosis, where there's too much activity or too much quantity of the thyroid hormones. So reverse T3 has another function as well, and that, that is it. Well, one of the functions. And uh, so all of these need to be checked to see where the problem is, pinpoint the problem and solve it at its root itself. And there's, again, there's, there's more to it than that. The, the liver also plays a very important role. So does the adrenals. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, then we've got here the TPO and TG. What that stands for? TPO stands for thyroperoxidase, which is an enzyme. And uh, it's actually supposed to say anti, uh, anti-TPO, which is basically an antibody uh, for the thyroperoxidase enzyme, uh, which is, has, plays a very crucial role in the thyroid gland. And it's more a diagnostic test for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition. But in many cases of hypothyroidism, uh, people tend to have elevated levels of these TPO antibodies. And then TG stands for thyroglobulin. Uh, and uh, there's, an, there's also antithyroglobulin. These are all um, other aspects of, of uh, biochemistry related to thyroid health that needs to be tested as well for other possible causes of your symptoms. And now, I did mention that the liver is important. That's because T4, majority of the conversion from T4 to T3 takes place in the liver. Uh, the liver is responsible for the metabolism of many nutrients, which plays a crucial role in the formation of hormones, um, <clears throat> as well as um, as well as for the the, the uh, conversion of uh, the thyroid hormones itself, as I mentioned, and the storing of certain nutrients like selenium, which uh, plays a role in the conversion as well. So the liver health needs to be assessed always in these uh, cases. And I would suggest not just getting an LFT. If you notice that you're holding any weight in the midsection, it's also good to get a, um, an abdominal USG. Now you may be thinking, wait, that's a little excessive, don't you think? Well, here's the thing. In a majority of cases where people develop a condition known as non-alcoholic fatty liver, uh, fatty liver disease, uh, there's no changes on the liver function test in the blood work. So it's really good to just as an annual thing to have your abdominal organs looked at, specifically the liver, uh, to see if anything's going on. Because if there's a problem with the liver, it can play a significant role in this condition. <clears throat> and the reason why I know this is so important is because the majority of the people who come to me with this condition, as well as uh, the condition that involves these antibodies called Hashimoto's, the only thing I ever recommend them to do is to up their selenium intake and to use something for the liver. Now, I typically recommend one of two products. One is called Live52, L-I-V.52. The other is called Liver Care. They're both made by a company known as Himalaya. And uh, of course, you need to use that with the proper supervision of an Ayurvedic doctor. Uh, don't, don't just take things blindly and, and follow recommended dosages on bottles because that's not the same as a clinically effective dose. It's very important to know what you're doing and be safe with what you're doing. Uh, but this is just for your information. Uh, those are usually the only two things I recommend anybody do, and they get a little bit of black seed into the diet itself as well. Not much pills, not much supplements at all. And in most mild cases and even moderate cases, this is usually enough to get things under control. However, uh, it can, in the more severe cases, it can um, require a bit more as well in terms of therapeutics. So what... Now that I've bombarded you with all the, 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 the bad information, the stuff that you can find on the internet anyways, let's talk about some solutions. Now I put number one as ashwagandha. I should have put selenium as the first one. Um, selenium is basically a trace mineral. It's, it's a, selenium is a mineral that plays a really important role in multiple aspects of our health and um, in terms of the thyroid gland, now firstly, it's a very potent antioxidant. <clears throat> it's very important to keep that in mind. Second, it plays a role in the formation of T4 and T3, as well as the conversion of T4 to T3. So selenium plays a, a really important role with your thyroid health. In addition to this, in clinical studies, su uh, supplementation with selenium has resulted in a reduction in TPO antibodies. Uh, which means it's highly useful in Hashimoto's, not just hypothyroidism. Uh, so selenium is very important. Uh, a lot of it gets stored in the liver itself, so it's very important to make sure your liver is in good health. Um, then ashwagandha is actually an Ayurvedic herb. It's a medicinal herb, very well studied, 
uh, it has multiple uses in the body, everything from helping the body cope with stress and reducing the stress hormone known as cortisol, as well as increasing stress, um, helping with certain hormones like in, in infertility for, uh, for men, uh, helping with heart health, cardiovascular health, as well as muscular endurance, and so many things, sleep, anxiety, depression, lots of clinical trials done in ashwagandha. But in the case of hypothyroidism, um, it's also been found um, to be highly beneficial in improving uh, the biochemical parameters of the condition. So uh, ashwagandha is one of those things that can be useful. It's not absolutely needed, but it can help and it can speed things along. It's not something that's going to reverse the condition. It's something that's going to help you to boost the thyroid function and improve your condition overall. Now, keep in mind, there's something that a lot of people here in the Western part of the world don't know about ashwagandha. This is a 5,000-year-old remedy. It's been used for thousands of years by, by Ayurvedic doctors. And it's very important that when you take ashwagandha, that your digestion is proper. You're not having any trouble with constipation. If you have this issue with constipation, you need to solve that first before taking ashwagandha. Or long-term, it can have adverse effects. That needs to be solved. Uh, and when you take ashwagandha, it must be taken with something that improves its bioavailability. That's going to be things like ginger, black pepper, long pepper. Uh, so there's specific ways to use ashwagandha. As far as dosages goes, it's a subjective thing. If you're going to follow what is used in clinical trials, then you have to keep in mind that in those studies, the way that the dosage is determined is based on who is based on what is known as an inclusion criteria, meaning the people that are taking ashwagandha in the study are not taking five or six other supplements. They're not taking a bunch of other medications. They don't have a whole lot of other conditions. They meet a criteria and they take that dose based on that. So the dosage, what's written on a bottle when you buy a supplement is a recommended dosage. It's not a clinically effective dosage. With ashwagandha, the dose can go anywhere from 500 milligrams all the way to 5,000 milligrams, depending on the form you're taking it in. Uh, so if you're taking it as a whole herb uh, powder, it could be much higher. If you're taking it as an extract, it depends on the type of extract. Then there's um, an aqueous extract. There's a, um, a decoction. There's a fermented extract. There's so many different ways to use it. So please use it with the proper supervision. Uh, the other two are generally easier to use, and uh, black seed is something you can include in your diet. Now, what is black seed? This is basically, it's a seed really. It's used uh, for culinary purposes, and it's got a bunch of health benefits that have been clinically validated and uh, found to be, there, there's a lot of claims on the internet about black seed. And I saw one article a long time ago that said black seed cures everything besides death. That's pushing things a bit far right there. But when you look at the number of studies, the hundreds of studies and clinical trials that have been done on it, you can understand why people would exaggerate it. This is used for liver problems, for arthritis, um, uh, for issues related to um, pain, inflammation, <coughs> um, as well as um, in the case of hypo Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which can cause the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Uh, black seed can actually improve these levels while reducing the TPO levels. So uh, there was one clinical study done at the University of Tabriz. So that's uh, really useful as well in this condition. So let's talk about diet. So when it comes to diet, there are multiple nutrients needed for multiple different purposes. And so we're going to go through each nutrient and where you can get it from and what, what is the purpose of it. So first is vitamin E. Vitamin E makes, um, makes an enzyme called deiodinase. Uh, which is really important for the conversion of T4 into T3. Uh, you can get it from almonds, sunflower seeds, salmon. The thing with vitamin E is you don't want to get, you don't want to overcook the salmon. Firstly, if you're going to use salmon, and then when it comes to sunflower seeds and almonds, you don't want to have them roasted uh, because about 80% of the vitamin E gets destroyed. Uh, next is copper. Now, copper and zinc actually go together. Uh, that's because uh, they, they balance each other out in terms of uh, your biochemistry. Too much zinc will deplete you of copper and too much copper will deplete you of zinc. But they also each play a specific role um, in thyroid health. For example, 
uh, zinc uh, it, it's it, this it's a mineral that that causes the um the release of a hormone known as thyroid releasing hormone uh, now i talked about thyroid stimulating hormone earlier but what is thyroid releasing hormone this is a hormone that is secreted from the hypothalamus which tells the pituitary gland to release tsh uh, so zinc plays an important role uh, for that and you can get zinc uh, from oysters pumpkin seeds, uh, salmon as well. I told you most of these you can get from salmon. You can also get zinc uh, in dark chocolate. And, uh, and then copper is also associated. Now, copper hasn't been as well studied as the rest, but copper is uh, associated. When copper is low in the body, it is associated with low levels of thyroid hormones. So copper obviously plays an important role uh, in um, thyroid hormone health. What we understand so far is that it plays a role in the formation of the hormones as well as the absorption of the hormones. Uh, but there's a lot more to, uh, to be known about copper in its relation to thyroid health. And in the future, we will get that information. But in the meantime, where can you get copper? You can get it in nuts and seeds. You can get it in dark chocolate. Trace amounts of it are also found in seafood, in certain types of seafood. Um, iodine. Iodine is really important. I'm sure you've definitely heard about iodine in its relation to thyroid health. It's, again, needed for the, the uh, production of both T4 and T3. Iodine is... Um, now, you, you have to make sure you have a proper diagnosis before using iodine because it can be toxic in other conditions, other thyroid conditions. Uh, so uh, make sure you get a proper diagnosis. You go to a doctor, you get all your blood work done, and make sure they test all of these things. If you go to somebody, they don't test all of those things. Uh, then you might want to go to another doctor and get, get them tested. Functional medicine doctors will test it. Ayurvedic doctors will test it, naturopaths. And, um, and usually, as well, in my experience, uh, the endocrinologists that I have met all test um, uh, this, uh, the, the whole thyroid panel. And so uh, once you have a proper diagnosis, if you are, for, if you are absolutely certain that it's hypothyroidism, you can uh, start to consume more iodine in your diet. And you can get that from... I don't recommend using the iodized salt. It's that has iodine added, iodine added to it. To it, uh, you can get it from seafood. Uh, like I said, <laughs> salmon. Salmon is the the probably the number one food for most of these things. Uh, you can also get it in eggs. Parsley also has a good amount of iodine. Selenium I mentioned already in its role in thyroid health. You can get selenium from Brazil nuts. You can actually overdose on selenium because there's so much of it in Brazil nuts. So be careful with that. It's also found in salmon again, as well as tuna. Uh, and uh, vitamin D. Now, what is the big deal with vitamin D? Why is everybody talking about vitamin D? So vitamin D is um, low levels of vitamin D associated with elevated levels of the TPO antibodies. So when it comes to Hashimoto's, this is very important. Oh my God, that's a big check mark. <laughs> and uh, so vitamin D is very important. If you find that you're deficient in it, you're actually going to have a hard time metabolizing each of these minerals because vitamin D plays a crucial role in the absorption and the uh, metabolism of certain, uh, certain minerals. So you need to get that taken care of. It's extremely important. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, vitamin D is associated with Hashimoto's more so than hypothyroidism. There are studies though linking into hypothyroidism, suggestive um, uh, studies. It's, uh, it's my understanding that vitamin D plays a crucial role in our overall health. From all of the, the data that I have gone through, Vitamin D is probably one of the most crucial nutrients that no one should ever be deficient in. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the, uh, the time during which vitamin D started becoming so deficient in people, it goes hand in hand with the time during which chronic illnesses started becoming more common and so did autoimmune conditions becoming so common. And we find that in almost every autoimmune condition, vitamin D is low. So it's really important to get this under control and uh, you can get vitamin D from sunlight. Sunlight, actually, what happens is when the sun rays uh, hit your skin, they interact with the cholesterol in your skin, and they form vitamin D. And so now not, not everybody gets um, enough vitamin D just from sunlight. And the reason I say that is because not everybody is able to metabolize vitamin D 
uh, efficiently, especially if you're consuming almost no cholesterol in your diet, no fat in your diet. They, these things have a purpose. <clears throat> if you're taking anti-cholesterol medicines that may in theory be a problem, uh, any issues with your liver or your kidneys, the reason why is vitamin D is metabolized through the liver and kidneys. In fact, even when you supplement with vitamin D, it's not the active form of vitamin D. Even D3 is still not active. Um, it has to go through the, the liver and the kidneys to fo form into what's known as calcitriol. Or calcitriol. Uh, that's the active form of vitamin D. And so um, there's, there's a lot more to when it comes to vitamin D that needs to be discussed. I'll do that in another video. Antioxidants are also very important. Now, what's the big deal with antioxidants? It's another very common thing. We see those words. We see that word everywhere, antioxidants. This is rich in antioxidants. That's rich in it. What is the big deal? Antioxidants, uh, basically, they protect your DNA from DNA damage. Um, they protect your, your body overall from the damage of free radicals. Now, if you look at the way anything deteriorates in nature, it's usually due to oxidation. Antioxidants slow that rate down. So they play a very important role in most chronic illnesses, uh, as well as our general health. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now next, uh, now there are some specific antioxidants, and, and you can get these, um, you can get these in most fruits and vegetables. Blueberries have a ton. Believe it or not, salmon, as I've been preaching <laughs> this whole time, contains an antioxidant known as astaxanthin, which is a very powerful antioxidant. And then last but not least, uh, anti-inflammatories. Why anti-inflammatories? Well, inflammation plays a role in, again, almost every chronic illness. Uh, inflammation can also be a result of certain illnesses. Uh, so inflammation needs to be controlled. And the reason I say this is because inflammation in your gut can lead to problems like this. Inflammation in the liver can lead to problems like this. Um, so it's very important to keep inflammation under control at all times, as well as free radical damage. So antioxidants and anti-inflammatories go hand in hand. Now, when I say anti-inflammatories, I don't mean ibuprofen or any, any drug. I'm talking about your diet. You need to be getting anti-inflammatory foods in your diet. Now, you can Google anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, it's going to be things like turmeric, ginger, again, salmon, because it contains omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatories. And it has some vitamin D in it, which is anti-inflammatory. I didn't mention other food sources of vitamin D. I forgive me. You can also get some from cod liver oil. You can get it from fish, um, like uh, salmon and um, <clears throat> cod, obviously, uh, sardine as well. You can get some from butter and ghee, uh, and uh, but mainly sunlight. And then if you're not able to get enough supplementation, but that should be the last option. Uh, and I'm coming back to anti-inflammatories. So the anti-inflammatory foods, like the spices I mentioned, like salmon, there are many anti-inflammatory foods out there uh, and you should get more of those into your diet. Now, usually the antioxidant-rich foods are also filled with anti-inflammatory compounds. So these, again, go hand in hand with each other. So those are some of the uh, recommendations for hypothyroidism. Uh, and I hope this information has helped you. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can do so through my website, drnishal.com. I do online video call consultations. So no matter where you are in the world, you can get in touch with me and I can help you. And I'll see you in the next video.